Hi. Today I want to talk about how minerals are actually constructed from atoms and stuck together. So here, for example, are isolated octahedra. We've, we've talked about those. And the question is, how do these octahedra link together to build up a structure like this? This, for example, could be halite, sodium in the middle, chlorine around the outside to form this cubic crystal, like this cubic crystal right here. So the first thing I want to do is review coordination. This is something we've talked about before. Talk about how atoms link together in minerals. Think a little bit about spatial arrangement of atoms, so what crystal structure is all about. I'm going to spend some time talking about crystal chemistry, and then I want to review the main silicate structures. A lot of this lecture is actually going to be talking about Pauling's rules derived from a fellow Linus Pauling. So the purpose of this lecture is to explain how atoms link together in minerals, distinguish the regular spatial arrangement of atoms, and distinguish that from which elements actually occupy those spaces, develop the systematics of the main silicate structures, and then determine which minerals exist within the crust based on elemental abundances. We've talked about that before too, but I want to return to it. So Linus Pauling won the Nobel Prize for his research into the character of chemical bonds. And he has five different rules, coordination, electrostatic valency, sharing of polyhedral elements, one and two, and the principle of parsimony. I want to emphasize these are guidelines. They're called Pauling's rules, but they're not strict rules. But regardless, they help us understand crystal structures. So the coordination principle is that a coordinated polyhedron of anions forms around each cation. So this is the whole thing of looking at the radius ratio to figure out how many anions pack around each cation. The bond length is determined by the sum of the radii. So you're looking at the radius, if this is cesium in here, the radius of cesium plus the radius of chlorine defines the bond length. And that's a different bond length than the radius of sodium here plus the radius of chlorine. Remember that the coordination number is largely determined by the radius ratio. So a bigger difference yields smaller polyhedra. So here's a, here's a question. If you have a highly charged cation, which of the following is most likely true about coordination number and bond length? So highly charged cation is, does it have a lot of anions packed around it? So the coordination is large. Or are there only a few anions packed around it? And then is the bond length large or is the bond length small? And the answer is that the coordination number is small and the bond length is small. So remember that as a cation is highly charged, it has a very small radius. If it has a tiny radius, it has very few anions packed around it, like this carbonate molecule. So the coordination number is small. And if this radius is small, then the total bond length is also small. The elect that was the first. Pauling's rule. The second one is electrostatic valence rule. And this one basically says there's local charge balance, that the electrostatic bond strength is given by the charge on the atom. So for example, if you look at the silicon atom, which is plus 4, it has to be balanced by a net charge of minus 4. I don't really worry about this one too much. It does help predict isotope fractionations, the strength of a bond does. But for this course, this is not a major rule to be too concerned about. So at this point, looking back, I hope you can predict coordination given ionic radii and a table of radius ratios and how that corresponds with coordination, but then also to relate ionic radius, bond length, bond strength, and coordination to each other. So what about mineral structures? A third of Pauling's rules is that crystal structures become less stable when polyhedra begin to share edges or faces. The reason for this is that the positively charged cations are trying to repel each other, and they try to maximize their, the distance between them. So here are some silica tetrahedra. Actually, all of these are silica tetrahedra. And if these are not distorted, you just stick them together, 
if they share corners and we say this distance is 1, the distance between cations if they share edges is 0 0.6 and if they share faces is 0 0.3. So this structure is very unstable. It's very unstable because the cations are too close together and they're trying to repel each other. This structure tends to be more stable. Now if they do share edges or if they do share faces, then the coordination polyhedra tend to distort to try to separate the two positively charged ions. So here is an example where silica tetrahedra are separated. So that's common in many minerals. Where they are very close together like this, that's very rare. When they actually share an edge, that's extremely rare. And what happens is this edge length shrinks. These edge lengths expand to separate out these two highly charged cations from each other. So which configuration do you think would be the most stable? And the answer is when the polyhedra corners share, because that's when the cations are most strongly separated from each other. The last rule, parsimony. Parsimony means less is more. People who are very parsimonious try to get by on as little material goods as possible. And the notion here, I love this one. This is probably the most important concept that I bring to my understanding of mineralogy. The idea is that crystal structures tend to have a limited set of distinctly different cation and anion sites, okay? So what does that mean? It means a crystal, think of a crystal as a box, and that box only has a certain number of sites that ions can go into. So for example, if we take an amphibole, amphibole is a group of minerals, it has a huge range of chemical compositions, and to a first approximation, it consists of a tetrahedral site, three different octahedral sites, and one alkali site. Okay, so what is that? One, four, five different sites. Five different sites. And those five different sites are preserved in every amphibole. Every amphibole has this. But the chemical variation can be large because there's so many different elements that can substitute into those different sites. Here, for example, are amphiboles that have different substitutions into these octahedral sites. There's actually two octahedral sites represented here. This one is pure magnesium, and it forms the mineral tremolite. This one has a mixture of iron and magnesium. This is actinolite. That's kind of like olivine, right? There's a magnesium olivine, which is forced to write, and a mixed iron magnesium olivine, which is called olivine. Hexagonite is a manganese-rich version of this amphibole. So it's all the same structure, just different chemical substitutions into these octahedral sites. There can also be different substitutions into this larger octahedral site. So here is our actinolite. That's that same green mineral that we saw in the previous slide. This is biotite, by the way. It's not an amphibole. If iron and magnesium substitute for calcium, then we have a new amphibole. It's called anthophyllite, which is this outer rind. Sodium can substitute into this larger octahedral site. Now, if it does, sodium is plus one. Calcium, iron, and magnesium are plus two, so there has to be charge balance here somewhere. And the way it's charge balance is by adding aluminum, which is plus three, into this octahedral site. This substitution into this larger site creates a different mineral. This is glaucophane. And then we can also substitute ferric iron into this octahedral site. It has the same charge as aluminum. And then we get a new mineral. It's called chrysidolite. This is the really dangerous carcinogenic blue asbestos that people really want to stay away from. So here's a challenge. Which of the following mineral pairs would you predict to have similar structures?
And the answer, surprisingly, is zircon and xenotene, even though one is a silicate and one is a phosphate. If you look at these minerals up here, for example, this has two cations, this has three cations, so these have, this has to have a different number of sites than this one. Here, these atoms are in a different proportion to these atoms, plus there's an OH here. This one has a totally different number of oxygens, even though the cations are the same cations that go in. They go in in different proportions. If you look at the structure of zircon, it has these silica tetrahedra and these zirconium oddly shaped large sites. And xenotheem has phosphate tetrahedra and these large oddly shaped yttrium sites. So even though the chemistry is totally different, the structures are the same. So now I hope that you would be able to predict whether an arrangement of polyhedra is likely to be stable. So are the cations separated from each other close together? And then also from chemical formulas, you might be able to predict whether two minerals might have similar structures. So the last thing I want to talk about are, we can imagine all kinds of different minerals and structures, which ones are really common. If you look at the abundance of elements in Earth's crust, oxygen is by far the largest contributor. Silicon comes up next. And then we see these elements, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, and, and a few others. What does that mean? Most minerals are going to be made up of these most abundant elements. And in fact, that's what we see. If we look at the crust, silicates constitute about 92% of the Earth's crust. A lot of that is feldspar. Feldspar, silicon, aluminum, and oxygen are the most important constituents. And those are the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. It's not surprising that feldspars make up a large proportion of Earth's crust. Carbonates are common. Car carbon is fairly abundant. Phosphates. Phosphorus is fairly abundant. Almost all of it is in phosphates. Oxides and oxyhydroxides. And then it sort of depends on who you talk to. Sulfur is a common element. The halogens, fluorine and chlorine, are pretty common. So these tend to make a lot of halides. These tend to make sulfates and sulfides. But the really common ones uh, clearly are the silicates. So let's talk about how we put minerals together. None of these polyhedra that we've been talking about in previous lectures are electrostatically stable. For example, if we take a silica tetrahedron, the silicon has a charge of plus 4. Each of the oxygens has a charge of minus 2, and there's four of these. So although a minus 1 charge from each of these oxygens locally balances the positive charge on the silicon, there is still a net negative charge on each of these oxygens that can be used to bond with other elements. And so what does this do? This attracts other polyhedra. So here are our silica tetrahedra. They mutually attract each other and they bond in the corners, but they can also attract octahedra and join together in the corners with these octahedra. Now, the silica tetrahedra, this is the basic building block of silicate materials. Anything that has a silica tetrahedra in it as an essential constituent is referred to as a silicate. Anything that does not is called a non-silicate mineral. And it is this silica tetrahedron that defines a lot of the structure of silicates. Now, exactly what you get depends on how much silica there is versus other cations. If there's a lot of silica around, you have a lot of these silica tetrahedra, then you will form very silica-rich minerals where the silica tetrahedra are all interconnected with each other in various ways. If there is not very much silica around so that there's a lot of, let's say, magnesium octahedra or iron octahedra or calcium octahedra, then we can still form silicates, but the silica tetrahedra won't be connected to each other in quite the same way. Silicates that have the lowest silica content are called mesosilicates, or I call them island silicates. These are examples where the silica tetrahedra do not interconnect with each other. They interconnect with other polyhedra. 
A great example of this is olivine, where all of the silica tetrahedra are interconnected with magnesium and iron octahedra. Garnet is another example of an island silicate. The next more polymerized silicate, so meaning that the silica tetrahedra are more connected to each other, are called sorosilicates or bowtie silicates. So these have two silica tetrahedra connected to each other. If you look down on the silica tetrahedra, they look like triangles. You're looking at the base of the silica tetrahedron. Another one over here, they join at the corner, and this looks a little bit like a bow tie. Examples of that are hemimorphite, so it's a zinc silicate. Here's that Si207 structure. Other examples are epidote and lawsonite. Cyclosilicates are ring silicates. If you add up all of these silica tetrahedra that are connected in a ring, they form a structure which is Si6018. And this is what forms the structure of beryl. The gem form, a gem form of beryl is emerald, if it's green, which has this composition. Here's our Si6018 here. And of course, these have these big, long tubes running down the center. So there's this, this big open channels running through these structures. If there's more silica, then the silica tetrahedra can connect on their corners in chains. There are two main types of chain silicates. There are single chain silicates and double chain silicates. Single chain silicates are the pyroxenes and peroxenoids. Here's an example of a pyroxene, enstatite, MgSiO3. So there's a chain of silica tetrahedra that links up with a chain of magnesium octahedra. Double chain silicates, you take one chain here and you link it up with another chain here. So this, these are the cross linkages between these two chains. And this is what forms the amphiboles. If you look at the basic structure, it's an Si4011, or if you multiply by two, Si8022. And that's what gives rise to amphiboles like tremolite that we were looking at before. If those chains continue to connect in that same dimension, in that same plane, then we end up with a group called the phyllosilicates or sheet silicates. The basic composition there is Si205. And an example of that is serpentine. So here are our silica tetrahedra all connected in a single plane. They form this kind of honeycomb pattern. And serpentine is a great example of that. Here's our Si205 component. And then last, it's possible for the silica tetrahedra to connect not just in a plane, but also in the third dimension. In that case, they're called tectosilicates or framework silicates. The unit composition here is SiO2, and quartz is a, is a great example of that. Feldspars are also tectosilicates. So at the end of this, in addition to all the things we've talked about for parts one and two, I would hope you would be able to link the more common mineral groups with the more abundant elements in the crust, and then to use images of the arrangement of polyhedra to classify a silicate mineral. So is it an island silicate or a bow tie silicate or a sheet silicate, tectosilicate, and so on. All right, thanks.